there's three distinct phases, and we ended up by looking at phase zero, um, where our goal was to figure out what we're actually going to monitor. So if we look at, at this example for this three phases, phase zero, we're going to monitor. Phase one is what we're going to consider today, and phase two, where we build the chart and use the chart. Um, what, I, what I thought I'd maybe also just start with is just show you some um, that I came across the news today. Uh, here's an example of a monitoring system developed in Quebec and parts of the maple trees and maple syrup. So often one of the issues is they run all these plastic tubing from the trees to the central location that collects the sap. And if a tree branch falls or a squirrel gets into the tubing, there's a loss of valuable material. So what this company has done is that they've put various pressure sensors along the tubing and they monitor the pressure along the pipe and watch and monitor the any animal pressure drop. And the key thing that's novel here is the wireless transmission of the sensor information. And if you read the article further, um, I'll post it on the website. Okay, so they're monitoring vacuum pressure. There's a tremendous economic gain if they can pick up that pressure. Um, it's a very simple system just to monitor, and then it sends out a real-time uh, text message or an email when it detects an abnormality. So how is the system then picking up the, the problem? What's it detecting so that it can send out that email or the text message to the user? Um, so it's a, it's a fairly simple process, and you'll see this in chemical plants where you'll work in the future. You'll also see these automated systems. How do these automated systems pick up that there's a problem with the process? That's our goal here with troubleshooting. I'm uh, sorry, with process monitoring. So we can use it to troubleshoot later on. Recall we said we're going to do nothing to our process and take no action as long as we're within those limits. But the moment we reach those limits and stay outside them for some time, that's the point you want to receive the text message or the email or the notification that something has gone wrong so that you can go fix up the problem. So phase zero is figuring out what you're going to measure. Phase one is figuring out three things. What are your monitoring limits, your targets, and your upper control limits, and your lower control limits? Okay, so that's, that's the part we're, we're focused on now. So we've assumed you've got your variable in mind. Now you want to figure out those limits. Let's talk a little bit about some terminology that you'll see. Um, if you're in this area, if you're in Six Sigma or quality improvement, there's this terminology of being in control and out of control. So it doesn't have the regular meaning that it's assigned to being out of control. When you say something is out of control, it means you're abnormal, the abnormal operation. The converse is in control, that's desirable. We would like our process to be stable and in control. And what we say there is that we only experience common cause variation. What does that term mean, common cause variation? If we go look back at this chart, recognize that over time here, there is variation. Common cause variation or in control variation is simply variation that you're willing to accept. This is normal, adequate, okay variation. If you were selling this product, you would be quite happy to sell all this product produced during that time to your customer. And you would be confident that your customer would not be complaining about it. Okay, so in control operation is that out of control operation means that something has taken place that's unusual. We say that there's an assignable cause. You may not know what the cause is yet. That's what your goal as the engineer is to figure that out. But there's something that's happened cause an upset to the process, a destabilizing event, or if we say you're off target. So, so those, those terminology um, are important to understand. Okay, so let's take a look at the most simple control chart. It's called the Schuart chart. It was developed in the 1920s, so almost 100 years old, and was developed for simple parts manufacturing. It was developed at a time when obviously control systems and data acquisition systems were not present. So the technology used behind 
this chart is very simple, very, very easy to implement in practice. And as a result, it's still the most widely used control chart. So we need three things to make this control chart work. The lower control limits, the upper control limits, and the target variable. Let's see how we, we do that. So think of the history of the Shua chart. The Shua chart came out of the Dell telephone um, manufacturing system where they were producing parts, literally the production line of telephones and devices used on the Bell network where someone sitting there measures every single part passing by. So the thickness or the diameter or some aspect of the process is being measured. There's the first measurement, second measurement, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. So you're getting a string of measurements in time coming by. What the Shua chart does is it says, let's take five, sample size of five. You can choose any value. Make it seven, make it three. You're going to see in a minute that there's some trade-offs though between that number. But let's take a value of five. What the operator will do is that they will take those five values, add them up, and calculate the average. So that's something that someone can very easily do. Calculate the average of those five values, and we call that average x bar. X bar of one. And then you get your next five samples, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You calculate your next average and call that x bar two. And what we're going to monitor, in fact, are these x-bars. We're going to pay no attention at all to the raw data. Those raw data are simply discarded. Once we've calculated the average, we throw the raw data away and we never use it again. Those x-bars come from the normal distribution. We remember back in the second section of the course we said, from the central limit theorem, if you take the average of enough data, it doesn't matter what distribution that the raw data comes from. It could come from a uniform distribution, an F distribution, but once you take the average of those N data points, those that average X bar comes from the normal distribution, the same mean as the original distribution, so mu is the original distribution's mean, and the reduced variance. Whatever the original distribution variance was divided by N. So we know what X bar is and we can then go and define the standard deviation of x, y, so the square root of that term, so sigma over time. So that's all standard stuff we covered. That subgroup average, so that term, subgroup average, refers to these x bars, x bar 1, 2, 3, we call those the subgroup averages. Those subgroup averages now will have a mu over mu, and they'll have a standard deviation given by sigma over root 10. And it's this standard deviation that we use to find the upper and lower control limits. The mu makes the most sense, obviously, as the target. So if we go look back at that chart, the target, the most natural value for the target is mu. So that's easy to calculate. Let's take a look at the next two things here, the lower control limit and the upper control limit. How far up do you go and how far down do you go? standard deviation up. If you went up one standard deviation, you went down one standard deviation. How much, what area, what fraction of all the data would lie within one standard deviation up and one standard deviation down? Seven percent. Two standard deviations, around 95. And with the three standard deviations, 99 point something. Okay. So that's exactly what we we pick then is we simply move up three standard deviations and we move down three standard deviations. Why three standard deviations? Well, if they cover so much of the area, 99 point something, it means that the probability of seeing a data point outside there when the process is operating well is very low. There is no more useless monitoring chart in the world than a monitoring chart that's throwing all Alarms. Within less than an hour, the operators will never use that chart again, and all the work you've done to develop that chart will disappear. There's no more useless operating chart, a monitoring chart, than a chart with high false alarms. No operator will tolerate it because you're telling the operator to go investigate something that doesn't exist. So 
we don't want to throw off false alarms by any means. And so we pick limits up and down that capture a significant portion of the data so that we don't throw off false alarms. Let's take a look at um, this from a histogram point of view. If my raw data came from this very broad distribution down here, and there's the standard deviation of the raw data, the subgroup averages x bar comes from the distribution given by the thicker line. And I've shown there three standard deviations up of sigma x bar and three standard deviations down. Notice that lower control limits and the upper control limit pretty much capture almost all the area. And that's exactly where the term six sigma comes from. Six sigma isn't some sort of magical data analysis and quality thing. All that six sigma is, is literally three standard deviations up, three sigma down, and three sigma up. Okay. So you see a lot of hype around six sigma in your career. Take a pinch of salt. All it is is simple distribution data analysis. Okay. People will make you go on courses of $5,000 per course to teach you this sort of stuff. It's basic, basic statistics. Companies kind of get all worked up about it. There's really not much more to it than that. Okay. So six sigma is that range there, three sigma below and above that captures the data. And you can go calculate that and prove to yourself at home, please, that that area is about 99.7%. So that's your goal for trying that out. If you calculate the probabilities there, it's saying that one in 370 that you're throwing off a point that's outside of those bounds. Okay, so one in 370 is that there's a probability of that on the data point line outside the bounds. Now let's be really careful here because that's one in 370 of x bar. So one in 370 of your subgroups will lie outside those lines. Your raw data you'll have far more than 370 raw data points. Because remember, if you take averages of five raw data points, we're saying only one of these subgroups will be out of the limits in 370 occasions. So if you've got five raw data points, and let's say these raw data points are coming to you once per minute, so you're going to get an X bar once every five minutes, you're only going to get a false alarm one time in five minutes times 370. That's a long time between false alarms. So now you can see why what the trade-off is between subgroups and size. If you choose a small n, what's going to happen to your x bars? Let's say n is equal to 2. has 
something wrong for 10 minutes and then goes back to normal, and you've only got 10 samples, but you've got an average, the window size is 20 samples, you may not even pick out that disturbance or that abnormality that's occurred. Because you're averaging over 20 data points now that washes out the problem. And it also makes the time to detect the problem much, much longer. So there's no obvious and correct answer to the selection of n. People always struggle with that. Too small means that you're simply picking up false alarms. Too large means it's going to take long before you pick up the problem. Okay, so you're going to get good averaging and good smoothing, but you're not going to pick up the problem fast. And rapid problem detection is just as important as detecting the problem. Anytime a problem, you'll see this in your companies as you start working, anytime a problem occurs, if you go and investigate the problem three days later, the operators have forgotten what's going on, any context around what changes they made, changes to raw materials, unless you've got a company that keeps really good records, you're going to struggle to figure out what the problem is. People's memory disappears and they move on to the next thing. If you go and try and take a problem within 10 minutes of it, that's going to be far more effective. So the detectability of the fault is, is, is just as important as picking up the fault itself. Okay, so these, these calculations that we've done here, they to calculate the upper control limit, that's three sigma above the target, the lower control limit is three sigma below the target. They're very straightforward. But they assume you know what mu and sigma are, but you don't really ever know what those two values are. So we go and replace them with our best guesses. So mu, a really easy one to replace mu with is often you know what the target is. Certain variables on the process have set points for their targets that naturally are specified. So you can go use that for mu. Or you could go take a whole long period of data and provide the process of producing mostly good products, the median of that long sequence of data will be an adequate guess for you. The other way that you can do this, and this is the way you would do this in phase one. So remember phase one is so phase one is all about calculating the lower control limits and upper control limits. That's what phase one is about. If you're doing this in phase one, you would just go to your data and take xr1, xr2, 3, 4, whatever those averages are, and take the average of those averages. Okay, so let's take a look at what that terminology means here. Capital K is the number of subgroups you've decided to use in phase one. So this is your thinking. You're sitting at your desk and you think, wouldn't it be great if we had a monitoring chart on pH? So you go to your database in your company and you go get the pH values for the last two weeks. And you look at those pH values and there's a thousand pH values for the last two weeks, let's say. You decide to use a subgroup size of 10. So now a thousand divided by 10 means you've got a hundred subgroups. So capital K then is a hundred subgroups. Your phase one data, the data you choose to build your monitoring chart. So you go to your database, pull out a vector of data, those are your phase one data, capital K is the number of subgroups you choose to make out of those phase one data. You go calculate those subgroup averages, and then you take the average of those averages, and that gets you x double one. So that's a good target as well. So any three of those options should agree pretty much with Try them all out, but they, they should be pretty, pretty much the same. The next one is sigma. So we dealt with mu. What do we do with sigma? Let's take a look at those subgroups again. If I look at those five data points, I can go calculate the standard deviation of the five points. Again, that's relatively easy to do by hand or on the, on the spreadsheet. Calculate the five, uh, take the five points and calculate the standard deviation. We call that S subscript K. And then we go calculate the average standard deviation. So 
sum of all your standard deviations, you take the average of that, we call that capital S bar. So the average of the spread. But that's not a true standard deviation, right? The true standard deviation would go calculate all your sum of all your points, square them, the deviation from B, and divide through by n minus 1. So this is really just an approximation to the standard deviation. And we need to correct it to reflect that. And the correction is fairly intuitive. It says that if your data set, sorry, if your subgroup size is small, you need to make more of a drastic correction. You divide it through by a smaller number so that can correct and upscale that S to more closely represent your standard deviation. Notice if the subgroup size is really large, the correction is fairly small. You make a whole lot of minor modifications. So there's a table that we simply just look at this table up. There's no, no, um, there's no need to go through the derivation of those values. But the key result is that sigma is approximated by S bar over A. And so now if we want to calculate by, by lower control limits and the upper control limits, we can say the target is at X bar and we can go up and down three standard deviations divided by root n. Well, if sigma is approximated by S over A n, sub that in for sigma, we still have the root n over there. And we've got our lower control limit. Sense. Okay. So, a fairly straightforward approach to convey that initial job. So, here's a practical example. Um, companies are now, as I said in the previous class, especially for solid products, will use video cameras to gauge the quality of the product. So, here's a company looking at the video picture of their plastic being produced, and that color has an average color. The average color, the raw data, there's five of the raw data. So it's simply the average pixel color. You can go prove to yourself and confirm that the average of those five values is 237, and the standard deviation is 9.38. For these, this is like one Calculation for lower control and just upper control. 
But we're not done yet. Because when you've gone to your database and you've pulled out that data, you have no idea that all that data actually came from this real operation. It's very likely that sometime during this period of time, there was actually some bad product being produced. So unless you pre-screened your data and know that all that data really is from common cause operations, so there's that new term we learned. So unless you're confident all this data comes from common cause operation, you, can, you need to go check and verify. So what we're going to do is, are any of my X bar points that I use up here outside the, the control limits, above or below? Well, the easiest way to go do that is to go plot your X bars. There's my X bars. And I notice one of them is, in fact, outside my control limit. So that value of outside the up control limit. So what I do is I drop out the 253 from my vector of x bars. So go over here, find that point, delete it out of your spreadsheet or out of R or MATLAB, and rebuild and refit the up control controls. So recalculate LCL and UCL. And the only reason why we're doing that is because we didn't know that that 253 came from that point. We go detect it and go exclude it, rebuild our data. So typically, you'll find you need to go through two or three iterations of this until you've got all the data out. Every time you exclude data, those limits come and pull in a little bit tighter on every iteration. Okay, everything clear on that? That's pretty tedious. People, um, people spend a little bit of time on this step. But once you've done this, you now are confident you've got a, a lower control limit and a higher control limit that really contain regular common cause operation. Yes? Um, what is the reason why you are going to investigate anything that's going to Yeah, you definitely should never exclude data points without investigation first. Yeah. But if you think of this phase one, often happens on a retrospective set of data. I built monetary charts of data that goes back three to four years. So going back and figuring out what one data point was is, is not really useful. Okay, so we've got our limits now. We've got my phase zero, I've done my phase one, and I've spent a lot of time then iteratively refining those limits. Now we want to go see how that chart works in practice. So that's phase two. Go test your chart on new data that you've never used before. So this is the key point. Pull a set of data into your system that you've never, never used on the chart before. You can either do that on this sort of software or simply just test it on the spreadsheet. My recommendation to engineers that are trying this the first time is to just try it out on your desktop the first few days before you go tell your operators to use this. You should go use it for a few days see how many false alarms show up on the chart. So give it a go yourself uh, before you let your operators do so. So let's see now what might happen in, in the future. You're running this chart, you've got your limits, and you've got new data coming in. So remember on Monday's class I showed you that, that simulation of all the data streaming across the screen. That's phase two, right? So this chart moving in real time in this link. Now we can have two things happen. This is the critical part of the business. Two things can happen. We can experience what's called a type 1 error or a type 2 error. We don't like either of these cases. We don't want either of these to occur, but they will. The first one, type 1 error, is everything is normal, but a point falls outside your limits. We've already said that that's going to happen 1 in 370 times. Everything x bar is a normal data point that comes from regular operation, common cause operation, but it happens to lie outside the limits. The probability of that happening is very small. We call that probability alpha. Down here, alpha is the probability that your subgroup is from in control operation but happens to lie outside the limits. Do you want alpha to be large or small? Small. 
small. We want the probability that a point is from in control operation by falling outside the loop. We want that probability of that occurrence to be low. As low as you can possibly get it. How can you make that probability lower? If you're unhappy with it, let's, see, let's say you're sitting at your desk and you're trying out this control system before you give it over to the operators. You want that probability, you want your number of false alarms to be smaller. What do you do? Increase your control limits by possibly adding back values that you can clear it out or screen up earlier. So why do you have your control limits? Put your lower control limit lower and put your upper control limit higher. Okay, remember there's nothing stopping you from going to 3.5 above and 3.5 below, 4 above and 4 below. There's no rule that says they have to be at 3 sigma. So again, people that get hung up on plus and minus 3 sigma, there's no need for that. You can put it at any value you like. So you can go make your limits wider and wider, and the wider you make your limits, the less and less false alarms you're ever going to have. What else is going to happen?
So to get a cancer test, for people to say, has a high false positive rate, one in four men will be, will be detected. Okay. Only about one in four abnormal PSA results are due to cancer. The false positive result will lead to unnecessary follow-up testing and biopsies. The false negative, on the other hand here, the ratio is about one in 10 for this particular test. So every medical test you'll ever go through, you should ask the doctor or the nurse what is the false positive rate and what is the false negative rate. You now have a more informed understanding of what those tests are. Okay, so bear that in mind. Um, now let's look back at processes. Uh, sorry, let's look at another example, airport screening. If you're working for a federal agency that's screening for at the airport, what way do you think they're biasing their x-rays and their detection equipment to have false positives or false negatives? They rather pull people aside and manually check them than have the case where someone go through the system undetected. So they set their systems intentionally to have a higher type one error and have a very low touch. If you are a judge and you're making a trial decision whether someone is guilty or not guilty, which is better, false positive or false negative? Would you rather send an innocent person to jail or send a guilty person free? <laughs> setting out some loaded questions so you can think of some type 1, type 2 errors. This occurs in everyday life. Right? So in chemical processes or radical processes, we have the same issue with our monitoring trials. There's far less at stake than say a jury or being tested for some disease. But we don't like sending our operators out to check the process for the problems that don't exist. Conversely, we don't want to run the risk of not picking up the problem because we've set our limits too high. Okay, so we're always trading off our type 1 and our type 2 errors. Let's take a look a little bit more at type 2 error. This is the error where the, where the problem has happened and we don't detect it. Let's quantify this a little bit. So here's my regular process in black and my upper and lower control limits are shown. So notice that, that that lower control limit pretty much has a very small area on the left and a very small area on the right. Now, at some point in time, my process shifts. I don't know when, but it shifts by amount equals delta times sigma. And this, this is just a convention we use. So if delta is equal to one, it means it's shifted by one standard deviation. Delta is equal to 5, it's filled up by 5 standard deviations. So that would be a very large, very small shift would be something around 1 standard deviation or less. So, let's say we've shifted by delta times sigma, so now our process actually falls at the red line. What we're going to see is the vast majority of my operation on the shifted process actually still falls within the limits. Only some of the operation falls outside the limits. And so when I ask this question, what's the probability that a new subgroup, that new subgroup will not come from the red dash distribution, what's the probability that that average x bar will fall within the existing limits? The answer is going to be one minus the shaded area. So it's just simply this area over here. And that's all that beta is. Beta is called this probability that x bar is not in control. So in other words, it's, it comes from the shifted distribution, but it lies still within the limits. So beta is the amount by which we quantify beta then as, as a judgment of our time scenario. So if we make very small shifts, in fact, a very small shift of 0.25 standard deviation, that's a barely perceptible shift. Occurred, you're barely going to pick up that problem has happened. Okay? Because so much of the, the, the shifted distribution still falls within your upper lower control limits. 
volume of the data extremely large shifts, two standard deviations, that's a huge shift, right? That's a, you're going so, so far away from your baseline. There, the probability of making that mistake is small. So what this, what this table points to is a real problem. Very small shifts in our process. So a shift of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, these very, very small shifts will not be detected, in fact, very rapidly by the Shuan's chart. And the Shuan chart, remember, is a chart, as I've shown you here earlier, the Shuan chart's primary purpose is to check for location, to make sure you're operating on target. And what you can see here, around time 150, your target of the process is still there at 10, but the true, the, the mean underlying the process has shifted upwards. And it shifted upwards, but we still actually haven't gone outside the limits. Okay. So it points to a real problem with the Shua chart. The Shua chart is actually not a very good detector of shifts in the process. Okay. And this happens all the time. In many engineering processes, we'll let's say you've got a flow rate into a tank. The flow rate into the tank is 100 liters per minute. Something happens, a change in pump speed or a change in the density of the material you're pumping, that now causes the flow into the tank to change to 105 liters per minute. So you've got a faster flow into your tank. And that's a problem if, let's say, your tank has the requirement for a specific residence time to complete the reaction to conversion. So now you've got faster flow into the tank, less residence time, less time to complete the reaction, and so now your conversion and the purity of your product vehicle is going to suffer. Okay, so there's a very small shift that's occurred in that flow, but you're not going to pick it up on a short chart. Okay, we're going to look at a very effective chart next to pick up small shifts. My key point with this derivation here is to show you that small shifts will not lead to a, a detection on the violation of limits. So what people have gone and done is, I'll just uh, go ahead to this slide here. People have gone and they have modified the machine on chart to make it more sensitive. So they you see this all the time in practice. Companies will add extra rules to their chart. They won't say the regular rule is wait till you're outside the limit and then a problem is So what companies will do is that they say if two out of three successive subgroups lie beyond the two signal limit on the same side of the target, throw out the one. So let's take a look at what that's a whole lot of words there. Let's, let's see what that says. Here's my target, and here's my upper control limit, which is three standard deviations above the target. So one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. So you can see fictitious lines drawn here, one standard deviation, and another line for two standard deviations. But we don't show those, we don't want to make our plot messy, so we only show my target and the upper control limit. There's also a lower control limit down here. So what this rule says is if two out of three points lie beyond two sigma on the same side of the target, then you throw out the line. So we're operating over here. And what that says is two successive points beyond two sigma on the same side of the line. So we're trending up, in other words. There's a warning, keep your mouth. Another rule is, it's a very unusual situation where four out of five points lie beyond one sigma on the same side of the target. So one, two, three, four, five points lie on the same side of one sigma. Or if we didn't trend that far up, it might have even been 
as five, four out of five successive points lie beyond one signal on the same side of the target. The probability of having these four out of five points on the same side above one signal is very, very small. Eight successive points on the same side of the center line. That's again very, very low probability. We're always moving above and below. So to see eight successive points on one side of the target is a very unusual event. Okay? So people then basically take the basic Shua chart and they supplement it with these extra rules to improve this Shua chart to pick up the problems. Okay? So that's that's all that that's about. And every company will have different rules. Some will go three out of four points beyond two sigma. You can program your computer system to, to work with any number of rules, any combination of rules. Companies will also implement systems such as the following. They will put that, arc, that chart to turn, say, an orange background color if you're beyond two sigma. And then they'll make the chart turn light red if you're outside of three okay, So you can add that sort of context to your monitor chart as well. Okay, um, one thing I just wanted to emphasize here, and I had said this earlier, in fact, Control charts are useless when they're throwing completely false alarms. So one thing you can do is simply adjust those limits. There's no, no reason why they have to be at the three sigma above and the three sigma above. When you're sitting at your desk and you're trying out the control chart, you should be starting at three sigma, but that's just your initial point. You can easily go higher and lower. Um, but as we said in today's class, you can never get both low alpha and high beta. You will always be trading off between making type 1 errors and type 2 errors. You can never achieve uh, both the low. And so you simply are finding the limits that give you the best medium. So the best middle ground to your choices. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave it there. What I'd like to look at today on tomorrow's class is we're going to look at one two variables simultaneously and I'll look at how we can fix up the short so we can detect